I've got good news and I've got bad news. Um, the good news is that we had this webinar last night where I taught the entirety of grammar for the SAT and the ACT um, in less than 60 minutes, and it went really, really well. Um, everyone had a good time, and uh, we got some good questions answered, and um, literally got through it in like 53 minutes. So it was remarkable and it was productive. Now, the bad news was that I forgot to record it. Um, yeah, there's, a, there's one little button you press, and um, I sure didn't press it. So um, this is me the morning after recording a kind of less than less than live version of, of, of the the, uh, the podcast, the webinar. Um, but uh, it, it's going to work just as well. And in fact, um, I'm sort of like I'm sort of like Michael Jordan after taking a hard foul or something like that. Um, I'm going to perform even better, even stronger. Uh, as a result of, of, of not having recorded it last night. So um, my, my bad news is your good news, I believe. Um, so anyway, let's, let's, let's kick some grammar butt here. You ready? Let's do it. So uh, quick intro, quick uh, kind of uh, credibility assessment here, just to make sure that, that you know that you can trust me. Um, that, that I hope you will. I, I don't know. Um, anyway, um, I've, been, I've been doing test prep tutoring since 2000, back when I was in college. Um, I, I had this one student you know, I, was, I was working with on the verbal section of the old, old, old SAT, uh, two generations ago. Anyway, um, she was great and we worked really hard and uh, she improved her verbal score by 110 points and uh, I got that voicemail and was pretty much hooked on the, the positive results of our work and I've been doing it ever since, who knew? Uh, I went to Princeton for undergrad, and I went to UCLA for a graduate degree in education. And I got perfect scores on the old, old SAT, the old SAT, the PSAT, the ACT, subject testing literature, math level two. Um, the point of this is basically that this stuff comes pretty naturally to me. Um, literally since I was, I think, five years old, like pre-kindergarten, I opened a standardized test and was just like, I'm home. It just it, these things make sense to me, so um, it, it's a it's a good career path for me because it's it's very natural. Um, I have a 1590 on the new SAT. I took it. I've taken it once officially, uh, January 2017. Um, if you want to get me riled up, um, ask me questions about that. Um, there are four test prep books by Tutor Ted on Amazon now. Uh, three titles that are retired, but we've got four active titles right now. Um, I have to retire titles when the tests go out of. Out of circulation, which is like super annoying. But anyway, um, we have online courses. This is our kind of like our brave new world thing. Um, SAT and ACT online courses at learn.tutorted.com. This is basically me sharing everything I teach my private students, um, just you know, all condensed into one course. So check those out for sure. Um, at the end of the uh, webinar, I've got a little uh, fun little offer. And above all else, really, uh, I'm a believer in non-boring test prep. Um, there is no point, really no point, in teaching if no one's listening. So if it's not engaging and if it's not a little bit fun or if you can't find a way to find some enjoyment within it, there really is no point. So that's, that's the fundaments of our, uh, you know, test prep organization is basically make it non-boring. If it's non-boring, People will listen, and if people will listen, then they'll improve their scores. And speaking of improving their scores, oh, you know what, let me get to that in a second. Uh, who are we, the company, uh, test prep company? Uh, we specialize in SAT, ACT, IC, SSAT, HSPT, and other tests. Uh, our office is in West Los Angeles, but we work with students around the world uh, via the web. Obviously, we don't fly to uh, uh, United, United Arab Emirates, but we do have students there. Uh, we have dedicated tutors. All of our core tutors have at least six years of test prep tutoring experience. Uh, we specialize in quality, not quantity. And, and uh, here's our score improvement data. Uh, our students have improved their SAT scores by an average of 170 points, and their ACT scores by an average of 5.5 points. And those are numbers that we're totally proud of. So um, the point I was going to make about, about improving your scores is basically, especially when it comes to this grammar stuff, when you know it, you know it. And you can't be fooled. It's not, 
these tests have changed over the years and they used to be, the SAT used to be the scholastic aptitude test. And that was very problematic, but the idea was basically getting at your, your core um, like intelligence and skill um, beyond what you've studied, more about what you, like how capable you are. You know, it, it was a problematic idea to, to try to assess that because um, test prep could totally hack that. Um, but now there, it, it's it's much more sort of a content test, content master test, especially this grammar stuff. If you know this stuff, you can't be fooled. You know, you literally can know all of it. That's the point here of this of this webinar is basically let me teach you all of this stuff. If you know it, you can literally ace this section. This section, by the way, the, the, everything we're talking about today will be will pertain to SAT writing and language which is half of your kind of reading test score, the evidence-based reading and writing score, and the ACT English test. So both of those tests represent one quarter of your overall score. And if you know all this stuff, you can literally ace that. So this, <laughs> this webinar is designed to help you ace one quarter of the test, which is pretty awesome and pretty amazing that you can actually do that. Um, and really, anybody can do it. You know, you just have to know the stuff. So let's do it. So um, we're going to start with a little exercise here where we're just going to make a sentence and use this to sort of prove a couple of points and, uh, you know, learn a couple of things in terms of uh, parts of speech and parts of a sentence. So here, here's the shortest sentence, almost the shortest sentence you can write. There is a way to write a one-word sentence, but uh, for simplicity's sake, I'm going to write a two-word sentence. I write. I am the subject. Write is the verb. We have a sentence. You always need that, a subject and a verb. In the one word sentences, the subject and the verb are combined in the one word, um, like a command tense verb, but that's, we're letting that go for now. Um, you won't see that on the test, I don't think. Um, this one has a direct object. I write what? I write a sentence. Okay, I changed the verb tense here. I wrote a sentence. Uh, past tense verbs, very common. That's what we use almost all the time. We're, we're storytelling, basically. Um, and storytelling means talking about the past, usually. Okay, added an adverb here. I wrote a sentence recently. It's a little bit of description, right? It starts to color in the sentence a little bit. Um, now, in the next version, I added two things, or I did two things. I moved recently earlier. Recently is an adverb. All the L-Y words are adverbs, um, and, and a few others, but mostly L-Y words um, make up the adverbs. You can move adverbs around in the sentence. You can't move adjectives around. That's, that's a rule. Um, I also added an indirect object, which is you. Uh, I recently wrote a sentence for you. For whom? For you. Um, now I added another phrase. This isn't a positive phrase that I added. It started, the sentence is getting longer, hopefully telling you more. I recently wrote a sentence, an organized and complete grouping of words for you. Um, the positive phrase, which we're going to talk about a little bit more as we go on, uh, is Extra information, descriptive information, defining sentence, basically, which, yeah, do you really need a definition of sentence? Eh, not so much, but um, I had to write a sentence, so that, that's why I did it. Okay, um, same sentence now with my favorite punctuation mark, the M dash, uh, which is that long dash. It's replacing both of those commas. It's essentially working as parentheses. The commas were essentially working as parentheses as well. Um, but I really like this version of it. I love the M dash. We'll come back to that. So you don't have to learn that and memorize it right now. But um, this is us putting together a sentence and having some fun with writing um, and hopefully learning a thing or two along the way. Here we go. Two rules of thumb, just like your most basic, you know, if you have five minutes to learn grammar, if you have 90 seconds to learn grammar, learn these two things. Take these into the SAT or ACT with you. Ready? Number one, shorter is better. You know, clean things up, get rid of stuff if you possibly can. I'd say on the ACT, if you pick the shortest answer, you'd be right maybe 75 or 80 percent of the time. On the SAT, maybe a little bit less than that, but definitely over 50 percent of the time. So we're going to develop much more like robust skills than this. But when in doubt, choose the shortest one. And then number two is get rid of as many commas as you can. These test makers seem to think that you use too many commas. So when in doubt, take them out. Okay, and then two useful terms. This is almost the end of our like technical um, terminology. Um, I do not, there, there's a lot of technical terminology with the grammar, tons and tons and tons. Um, I don't find most of it very helpful. 
uh, either for your practical usage in the everyday world, but even for the SAT and the ACT, I think you can be a really effective grammarian without knowing the names of this stuff. People develop hobbies out of learning all this stuff and whatever. It's just not that interesting as a hobby to me. Um, I like knowing grammar, but I just I don't, I don't think we need to do it that way. So anyway, there's a little bit of terminology that is useful. Here it is. Um, an independent clause. So this is basically, it's part of a sentence. In fact, it can be a, the entire sentence. Um, it's a phrase with a subject and a verb. We learned about that. You need that in every sentence. That expresses a complete thought. So I jogged to work. I is the subject. Jogged to work is the verb, basically. Um, and that's that's all we need, right? And it, it gets to the end of the thought. It doesn't leave us feeling incomplete. Um, by contrast, a dependent clause is a phrase with a subject and a verb that does not express a complete thought. So, because my car had broken down. You've got a subject, my car, um, and then the verb had broken down, but you have this extra word because, and that makes the phrase not, you know, this kind of tidy little package. Um, and the cool thing is now we can start to put these things together to make a sentence, uh, but we need that terminology. So I'll be using that a little bit. Independent clause, dependent clause. Independent means can stand on its own. Dependent means need something else. Okay, uh, comma usage. We're going to plow through sentence punctuation now. Um, this is this is useful. Okay. There's four ways to use a comma, literally only four. Um, number one, when a dependent clause is followed by an independent clause. So same same uh, clauses from that last slide. Because my car had broken down, comma, I jogged to work. That is a sentence. If you start a sentence with a dependent clause, you have to have a comma after it. Those are the rules. That's how it works. Now, in, re in the reverse, you do not use a comma. If you start with the independent, then the dependent, you know, I jogged to work because my car had broken down, you don't put the comma in there. And I think that's mostly common sense, but that's definitely worth socking away and realizing, like, it's the one with where you start the sentence with that weird word, like, because, when you need the comma. And by the way, yes, you can start a sentence with the word because, so long as you do it right, so long as you have the dependent clause, and then the independent clause, you're absolutely allowed to start a sentence with because your third grade teacher lied to you. Um, it's one of those weird things. One of those weird things where like you learn it one way first, and then later on they're like, I ah, remember that thing we told you? Yeah, actually not true, um, which is a funny, a funny technique within education, but I, I won't talk about that now. Um, rule number two, second way to use a comma. Joining two independent clauses with a comma and a fanboys conjunction. Fanboys is this acronym for for and nor, but or yet. So I guess that's one more slightly technical term for you guys to know. There might be one more coming up, <laughs> um, but not that many technical terms. But you want to know this one for sure. Um, there are all these little tiny uh, three letter or less conjunction words for and nor, but or yet. So say it 15 times out loud and you'll know all of them. Um, here are my two independent clause, clauses. Um, I'm pretty quick. It's not like I'm using bold. That's definitely true. I'm not sure about the first one, but the second one's definitely true uh, about me. So I can combine them with a comma and a fanboys. I'm pretty quick, comma, but it's not like I'm using bold, right? That's a sentence. So another great way to use a comma, if you have those two independent clauses, use a comma and a fanboys, and now you have a longer uh, what we call complex sentence um, that uh, sounds pretty good to me. Okay, rule number three, the one that you were thinking of when we started making this list, which is to make a list, right? This is the most common use of comma. This is how we learned to do it, you know, when we were, you know, we children. Um, you can make a list of nouns. People say my running style reminds them of a cross between an ostrich, a lemur, and a drunken Scotsman whose hat is on fire. Um, you see all the commas come after ostrich, after lemur. Um, the one after lemur, by the way, is a um, Oxford comma. What's the name for that, that particular comma? Um, which it, basically is the one before the and. On both the SAT and the ACT, they use the Oxford comma. It's sort of this weirdly controversial punctuation mark uh, within grammar where people don't agree on it necessarily. In fact, they actively disagree about whether you should or should not use an Oxford comma. Um, both the tests use one. They won't make you choose between using one and not using one because it's not, like the rules of grammar are not clear enough on it basically, but they will use one. So 
get to know. I listened to the Vampire Weekend song, Oxford Comma. Um, I love the first line of that song. And it's uh, it almost essentially summarizes my feelings about um, the technical uses, like the, the overly technical uses of terminology and grammar. Okay, moving on. Um, you can also make a list of adjectives. So um, a drunken, comma, angry Scotsman. In that situation, the comma between drunken and angry, it's basically replacing the word and. A drunken and angry Scotsman. Um, in other situations when you wouldn't use the word and, you also wouldn't use a comma. So for example, um, the local organic grocery store. You wouldn't say, you wouldn't call it the local and organic and grocery store, right? I mean, as soon as you say that, it's like, is he speaking English? Is he, is he an Android? Um, if you wouldn't say and, then you wouldn't use a comma. It's just the local organic grocery store. You just power right through, say it all, no commas. But here, because it's a drunken and angry Scotsman, the and works perfectly, you want the comma. Last way to use a comma, to bracket off inessential information, AKA in a positive clause. That's the thing I mentioned on the first page where we were making the sentence. Um, here's the sample of that. The Statue of Liberty, which sits in New York Harbor, is a cherished symbol of freedom. The phrase between the commas is this sort of like parenthetical bit of information. It's extra description. It's telling you about the Statue of Liberty, just like color commentary, additional information. Um, and uh, you want to put two commas around that? That's the, that's the fourth way to use a comma. Cool. All right, moving on. So we did commas. Let's do semicolons. Um, this is the sort of like, everyone th thinks they know how to use a comma, right? Everyone has used a comma in their life. Um, I think it's worth polishing that up and refining that and making sure you are totally confident in those four ways to use it and say, if it's one of those four ways, great. If it's not one of those four ways, I don't want a comma. Um, these punctuation marks, those semicolons, colons, and dashes, a lot of people, um, I would say most people's like mastery of these is around 40%, maybe less. So definitely know these things. These are, I guarantee you, on your test. Whether you're taking the ACT or the SAT, these are on your test. Know them well. Okay, semicolons, um, that's the one you can see the, the punctuation mark right there. It's got the dot and then the comma underneath it. Um, think of them as periods. They're, that's what they do. They, they function as periods. They break up a sentence into two independent clauses. Independent clauses are sentences. So here's the, the sample. The first time I fell into the pool, it was funny. The second time, it was embarrassing, right? Those are both sentences. They have a subject and a verb and a complete thought. They're closely related, which is why you might do a semicolon rather than a period. You would never have to choose between a semicolon and a period on the test. You'd never have to make that editorial decision because it's um, extremely vague, but um, like uh, editorial, you know, it's, it, it's just a matter of taste really. So um, you don't have to make those kinds of taste decisions. We'll talk about editorial, the kinds of editorial decisions you will have to make, but that'll be in about 20 minutes, I'd say. Okay, um, moving on. Basically, wait, no, sorry, before I move on, a semicolon is a period. Okay, uh, so colons, i.e. these guys. Uh, similar looking mark, we just have two dots rather than uh, uh, the dot and the comma. Um, I think of the two dots, it's almost like an equal sign because it's an equal sign because you're going to deliver something at the end of the sentence. Um, there it is. <laughs> they deliver something at the end of the sentence. Um, and it can be a list. This is really common. This is the one you probably were thinking already. Um, and that's how most people use them. The students were asked to bring only three things on the camping trip, a flashlight, a change of clothes, and a pocket knife, right? These are the three things is what the colon is saying. I'm going to deliver them to you. There's a list. You can also deliver a phrase. It doesn't have to be a list. So Samantha knew there was only one way to defeat the beast, punch it in its eye. Um, so that one is, is it's just a different kind of delivery style. I think that's a little more fun. You know, the, the list is, yeah, whatever, it's fine. It's, it's decent enough grammar. The second one is a fun way to write. And when it comes to grammar, um, I'm a writer um, and I'm a writer, but I'm also a human and we all, we all are humans and we all write. Um, and I think it's worth writing in an interesting way. And I think the second one is an interesting way to write. It's kind of fun to like have that, that delivery at the end of the sentence. So anyway, I can recommend, I will recommend things to do 
uh, as a writer because I, I, I can't help myself. Okay, uh, so more on colons. They're a little bit more finicky than semicolons. Semicolons are periods. I've said that like five times already. Um, I, I might say it one or, once or twice more. Um, it's that important. Colons have a little, have a couple more rules to them, a couple more specific tricks, um, just two more basically. So when you can use a colon, you can use it only after an independent clause. So if, aka a complete sentence, you always need an independent clause before a colon. That's how it works. You can't have a partial sentence before the colon. If you do, that's not the right answer. Uh, when you can't use a colon, you don't use them after words that set up a list the same way that the colon does. So, like for example, or including, you wouldn't say, you know, going back to this other sentence back here, um, you wouldn't say the students were asked to bring only three things on the camping trip, including colon. The two word, the the the, the two uh, pieces of punctuation, or whatever, however you classify those things, uh, including and the colon, they're doing the same work. So you only want one of them. You could say including and no colon. You could use the colon, but not including. So don't use the word, don't use a colon after words like for example or including words that are doing the same job as the colon. Cool. Last piece of random sentence punctuation is the M dash, my favorite. Um, use it uh, instead of commas to bracket off a positive clauses or in, AKA inessential, inessential information. Jared spent time on Oahu, the most populous of the Hawaiian islands, before deciding to move back to Montana. There's this extra little bit of information here, the most populous of the Hawaiian islands. It's describing Oahu, um, and it's between two dashes, and that, that's a fine way to do it. Um, and, and a little bit unusual. And I think that uh, I think sometimes being like readable but unusual uh, bring it draws your reader in. And I think that's that's worth doing. You can also use it to express a sudden change of tone or thought. Uh, this is a really fun one. So I hope we can stay in Philadelphia for a little longer or never leave at all. Notice how that dash creates a little moment of, um, I mean, drama or comedy. It's like a dramatic pause there. It makes the sentence work differently than if you didn't have it in there. If I just plowed right through, I hope we can stay in Philadelphia for a little longer or never leave at all you don't get the same comedy. It's not that funny. I'm not saying that this is like a hilarious sentence, but um, by ACT and SAT standards, it actually is hilarious. Um, but um, the, the point is, actually real quick sidebar, sometimes once in a while, the ACT will try to be funny. Um, you will not recognize it by laughing. Um, you will just look at it and say, um, the ACT is trying to be funny. So anyway, that that's that's like it's almost the kiss of death. But if you recognize it and you say, "Oh yeah, that's that's what's happening here," it won't it, it won't cause you too many problems. Hopefully, anyway, um, that's not that important. Um, this dash helps create a rhythm to this sentence that's kind of fun, um, and that's that's good. You know, fun is good. Making sentences more readable, more dramatic, more comedic, whatever um, makes your writing better. I would highly recommend you use the M dash in your writing. Okay, um, some more technical stuff. We have like 10 technical topics to get through. Once we get through those, then we'll move on to the editorial topics. And that's it. That's, that's all of grammar on the SAT and ACT. So first verb thing to worry about is subject verb agreement. We spend a lot of time in foreign language classes talking about subject verb agreement. We're doing it like from day one, basically. Estoy, estas, estas, etc. <laughs> Estamos, whatever. Um, okay, we do it in English too. We just do it sort of instinctively, not uh, not consciously. Here's the easy kind of subject verb agreement that hopefully all of you will recognize. We is hungry. That's wrong, right? We just that we are hungry is right. Um, are is the plural verb that matches with we is a singular, it doesn't match. So um, that's like the easiest kind in the world. You wouldn't see that on the test. Uh, if you did, it would be basically a gimme for everybody, but it just makes my point that subjects have to match their verbs. Here's how they can get a little bit harder. Um, research into cosmic rays use the surface of the moon as a detector. That sentence is kind of a mouthful anyway, but it's, it's wrong by subject verb agreement. Here's the right version. 
Research into cosmic rays uses the surface of the moon as a detector. So the trick with subject verb agreement is just identifying the subject and the verb. Um, you can see that the verbs that change here between the first and second sentence, it's either use or uses. Well, what are we talking about? The subject is one word, it's just research. So research uses the surface of the moon as a detector. You always want to boil sentences down to their component parts and the only required component parts are subject and verb. So if you can make a sentence into two words or close to two words, because sometimes you might have a compound subject um, or a verb with helping verbs, et cetera. Um, but when you can find those things and, and reduce the sentence down to like those, those little bits, you can say, oh yeah, this sentence is research uses. Then you can be really confident that you've matched the subject to the verb. Okay, so verb tense, that's the other way that verbs can get screwed up. Um, I wrote a sentence earlier in this presentation. I write sentences rather frequently. I will write another sentence in about 10 seconds. This is past, present, and future tense, right? The way that the test makers test you on this is basically what's in these sentences. They have to give you a timing clue. Um, there could be other verbs around that that verb, other present tense verbs, and say like, oh, okay, I guess we're writing this, this particular moment of the essay in the present tense. Um, you know, you can see a phrase like in about 10 seconds or, you know, in the year 2150, it's like that's the future. If, it, if it's in the future, then we have to use a future tense verb. Um, earlier in this presentation, you know, in 1849, those are clues that say, I need to use the past tense. So you wanna look for those clues. You have to basically be a reader find the evidence, and then match the verb tense to that evidence. So pronouns, um, another part of speech here, um, getting out of the sort of essential verb stuff. Um, pronouns are words like you, she, he, it, we, they, her, him, etc. cetera. Um, there's a bunch of them. Um, they're stand-ins for nouns. Um, we basically use them when we get tired of saying the same noun over and over again. They always refer to that antecedent. There has, there has to be a clear reference point, unless you're being poetic, which you, you can be, but you won't be in the SAT or ACT, believe me. Not a lot of poetry there. Um, the, here, here are the rules. Here, here's what you want to worry about when it comes to pronouns. There's two, two things, essentially. One is it has to be clear to which noun and sentence they refer. Basically, what's the antecedent? Again, with that name, antecedent, you don't have to know the name. I'm saying it because it's a fun word to say. Um, just know that the pronoun has to refer to a noun in the sentence. We have to know which one it is. So here's the sample sentence. The debt crisis created controversy in both Greece and Germany because it had not anticipated a downturn in economic growth. That it, that second it there, or the, I guess the first it, uh, because it had not anticipated. Well, what is it? Is it Greece or is it Germany? We don't know. We, we have no clues here. It could, could be either one. That's a problem. So in this case, we actually have to repeat the name of the country. The debt crisis created controversy in both Greece and Germany because Germany had not anticipated a downturn in economic growth. That clears up the meaning of the sentence, and we want that. We want to have clear meaning always. That's pretty much the goal of writing, having clear meaning and, and communicating something. Rule number two on pronouns is that they have to match their antecedent in number. So this is a weird one. This is where grammar starts to diverge a little bit from um, the real world. Uh, grammar, for the most part, does does kind of like kind of codify what we um, how we speak and think and write. Um, sometimes it the rules of grammar are more technical than the way we actually do speak or write. This is an example of that. So this is a pronoun issue. The family agreed. They are committed to the plan. That's wrong. This one's right. The family agreed. It is now committed to the plan. So hopefully you're grumbling right now. Um, if you're grumbling, you're, you're thinking about this stuff as a normal human being ought to. Um, the family. Family is what's called a collective noun. Collective nouns are, represent a group, but are singular in American English. So they is a plural pronoun. It is a singular pronoun. It's got to be the singular one to match the singular subject. What's tricky here is that in spoken English, we use they as a singular pronoun all the time. And it's, it's acceptable. It's actually acceptable in spoken English. Um, so 
Yeah, it's it's. I don't have um, I don't have very reassuring uh, advice for you on this other than you need to learn the technical rules of grammar, most of which you're going to play by for the rest of your life. Some of which are so specific and technical that you're really only going to use them on the SAT and the ACT. Learn them now and then forget them at as of you know 1:30 p.m. on the Saturday when you take the SAT or ACT. Okay, this is one of those. Okay, subject versus object pronouns. Same set of words, but deciding between the ones that are subjects and objects, aka I versus me. I do things, I am a subject. Things happen to me because me is an object. Me receives the action of the verb. That's the exact same distinction as who versus whom. They're the same thing. Who is a subject pronoun, whom is an object pronoun. Um, I'm gonna get into that and how you just how how you should decide between them in a second here. So here's the surefire method, two-step method for determining whether you want I or me, they or them, who or whom, she or her, etc. Um, rule number one, when pronouns are compounded, uh, when you've got a couple of them together, take out the extra nouns or people and then make your decision. The sudden increase in business for our lemonade stand came as a surprise to Brian and me. So that's correct. Um, a lot of people and a lot of students feel like they've been corrected to say, oh, I'm supposed to say Brian and I. Well, there are situations when Brian and I is correct, and there are situations when Brian and me is correct. And to decide, all you want to do is take Brian out of the sentence. The sudden increase in business for our lemonade stand came as a surprise to me. Doesn't that sound right? If it sounds right that way, that's how you want it when Brian is back in the sentence. That trick works every time. Um, try it the other way. Um, came as a surprise to I. Hopefully you know that's not the way to say it. And if you wouldn't say it with I, then you know when it's by itself, then you wouldn't say Brian and I when Brian's in the sentence. Like I said, it works every time. And then here's rule number two, which is about who versus whom. It's a little bit, th this rule is added because this makes who and whom a little bit easier, I think. Um, you want to answer the who or whom question. If the answer to the question is I, you want who. If the answer is me, you want whom. Um, the M's travel together. Me and whom um, are the ones that go together. So in the event of an evacuation, whom should I contact? Um, I'm going to switch the I to you there. Like, whom should you contact? The answer to that question is you should contact me, right? You wouldn't say you should contact I. Um, that's not good grammar. So if you should contact me, then me and whom work together. You want whom. Um, and then here's the, uh, the, the flip side, the other version. Who wrote the script for that hit television show? Let's answer that question. I wrote the script for that hit television show. If I wrote it, then I'm the answer to that question. Who wrote the script? I did. I and who travel together. Um, if the answer is I, you want who. If the answer is me, you want whom. Okay, that versus which. This is on the SAT, not on the ACT, but obviously worth knowing for that reason. Um, here's the really simple rule that's going to allow you not to learn about restrictive and non-restrictive clauses. Um, that's one of those things where, you know, you don't know that you should be thanking me for that. Um, but I'm doing you a favor, doing you a solid here, right here. Okay, um, so the, a phrase that starts with the word that never has a comma before it. A phrase starting with the word which always has a comma before it. That's how it works. The waterfall, which is fed by Lake Erie, is the most powerful in North America. The part that is on the Canadian side of the border is called Horseshoe Falls. Um, you know, if you felt like thinking about it a little bit more, you could notice that the which phrase is really in a positive, which it is, um, and that the that phrase is not in a positive, and the that phrase is more important to the sentence than the which phrase. You don't really need to think about that necessarily. You know, I mean, you can if you want to. You know, if you want to go deeper on this grammar stuff, which I have, and I think if you're interested in this stuff, as more of more as a hobby and as a user of the language, go for it. For purposes of the SAT, just know that you want a comma before which, and you do not want a comma before that. Misplaced modifiers. Um, so 
I talked about adverbs earlier at the very beginning with the sentence, and I used the word recently. The adverb could move around in the sentence. It could jump to almost anywhere in the sentence and it would still make perfect sense. Adverbs can do that. Those modify verbs and, other, and, and adjectives and other adverbs. Adjectives which describe nouns, they have to be next to the thing that they're describing. Can't move around. So then the next part of this rule is that sometimes adjectives can be phrases. And those phrases have to be next to the thing they're describing. Um, when they're not, we call them misplaced modifiers. So here's an example of a misplaced modifier. Swollen by heavy rainfall, Matt and I were overwhelmed by the majestic waterfall. You know what that sentence is trying to say. The problem is the phrase swollen by heavy rainfall, we know that should be describing the waterfall, not Matt and I, hopefully. So it can't be written the way that I just wrote it. Even though we, we all logically know what's happening here, we just, we can't say it quite that way. We need to move it around so that the, the noun that's being described is next to the description of it. Swollen by heavy rainfall, the majestic waterfall overwhelmed Matt and me. Make sense? The waterfall is what's being talked about by that phrase, by that adjective, so we need it next to it. Cool. Uh, possessives um, use a possessive apostrophe whenever one thing in a sentence belongs to something else. So in this case, in this phrase, the painting's beautiful colors. This is talking about the beautiful colors that belong to the painting, the beautiful colors of the painting. That's how we say it in Spanish. It's kind of helpful to think of it that way. Um, I, for me, um, if you don't know Spanish or haven't studied it that particular way, then it wouldn't be that useful to you. Now, if the owners are plural, if the thing that you know possesses within the sentence is plural, you want to place the apostrophe after the S at the end of the word. So um, the museum's apostrophe, joint venture, that's a joint venture belonging to multiple museums. At least two museums, could be three, could be 17, we don't know, uh, but it's not one, um, which makes sense for a joint venture. If you're doing a joint venture, you need to have at least a couple of museums, don't you? Okay, um, here's the fun exception to the rule. It's versus it's. I-T-S is the singular possessive gender neutral pronoun. That's what it is, I-T-S. I-T apostrophe S is it is or it has. Um, and this is a memorizer, you know, this is a, let me put it on the flashcard, let me put it on a post-it note and stick it on my bathroom mirror and see it every day for three weeks until finally I'm like, I get it. And you take it down and you know it. That's how this works. We have to like, we have to sometimes exhaust ourselves with this stuff until it becomes, you know, annoyingly second nature. Um, and this one's actually worth knowing in, in the real world as well, because you, you come off as a very competent user of the language when you don't screw this up. Um, so I love its beautiful colors, the beautiful colors belonging to it, the beautiful painting or whatever it is, um, that's possessive and that's why we want ITS, no apostrophe. And it's Tuesday, as in it is Tuesday. Both of those are correct. That's how that word that sounds like those homophones, yeah, homophones uh, work. Cool. Okay. Moving on to the editorial rules, I'm going to take a sip of my coffee. Uh, we're doing great, though. I think we're kind of powering through this. Um, I have no audience. I mean, I have, I have, there's no live audience right now, but I know that there, there will be an audience. So um, I'm, I'm performing, but uh, in the moment, I'm not really performing for anyone. So I feel like I can have a sip of this cup of coffee and, and uh, you know, just, take, just take a moment, really, for me. Okay, moving on. Um, so the editorial rules. Basically, um, there's a whole, everything we went through just now, those are the technical rules of grammar. Those are the rules you have to know, those are literally all of the rules you have to know for grammar, which is, to me, so amazing. Um, it's, it's probably been about maybe a half an hour now, a little over half an hour, um, and we've covered everything on one quarter of the test. Um, there's another set of questions that have to do with editing. Just making sure that an essay says what you want it to say. Um, let's let's go through those now. So these, by the way, I think people I think people initially think that these questions are going to be more um, um, subjective, right? That it's going to be a matter of like taste or preference. The cool thing is, and the thing to remember is, this is a standardized test. Whether you're on the SAT or the ACT, it's a standardized test, which means the right answers have to be right for everybody. How do they make them right for everybody? 
they include clues. So we're gonna be looking for those clues and we're gonna develop our skills at finding them and knowing where the test makers basically bury the clues um, and what kinds of clues to look for. So you're not reinventing the wheel, you know, you're not like, you're not trying to get, um, I don't know, you're like, you're not working too hard. You know what I mean? Like you're just, you're doing the work that you're expected to do and doing it very efficiently. Anyway, that's me talking and not being helpful. Um, here are your rules of thumb. Give them what they want. Whatever the test makers are asking for, you want to deliver it. You want to serve it up on a silver platter. We'll see some examples of that as we go on here. The other rule of thumb is be a reader. Basically read and, and understand, you know, get what they're trying to say. Um, and if you do, then you'll, you won't have any problems here whatsoever. Um, just think about as a reader, what, you know, what are the goals here? What's the, what's the goal of this paragraph? How does this serve the argument? All that kind of stuff. Basically, you're acting as if you were reading an essay for a friend. Um, you know, you're about to turn something in and your friend says, hey, can you take a look at this? That, that's the task here. Okay, so um, here's one editorial rule. We're just gonna cruise through a bunch of like editorial rules and preferences and topics. Uh, and I'm gonna use sample questions on, on this set of stuff because uh, the sample questions just demonstrate it demonstrate this inaction. Um, here's, um, shorter is better. I started with this. This is like your, you know, a number one strategy to apply to improve your score. Um, but now we'll talk about why. We'll see an example. So the Kennedy Center works all over the globe to eradicate poverty. It's a pretty good sentence. Um, take a look at B, C, and D, and notice that they all, if you plug them into that spot that's underlined, they all make a sentence, they're all grammatical. Um, the point of these questions is not to get the grammar right, but to get the, the writing right, to get the messaging right, to make sure that the, it's being said in the most helpful, uh, readable way. Well, shorter is better, so we wanna bias ourselves in favor of the shortest answer, which is the no change answer. Why is the no change answer the best one here, besides the fact that it's shortest? Shortest is good, but why? Here, the sentence says works all over the globe. If you say works all over the globe, do you need to say around the world? Or both at home and abroad or at an international level? No, all three of those are redundant. That's why in this, on this particular sentence, the shortest one is the best. Quick slide about why shorter is better. Um, one is uh, relevance. Basically, include information if it's relevant. If it's not relevant, cut it. Right, so like, don't don't add stuff in that we don't need. That's one reason shorter is better. Um, and then, as we saw on the last slide, redundancy. Right, if you say it once, you don't need to say it twice. That's how that works. Uh, we prefer to say things, you know, just the one time. Uh, we don't want to bore our readers, basically. Okay, sentence logic is one that's very common in both tests. This definitely requires being a reader and thinking about what the author was trying to say. So this sample sentence says. Uh, and sentence logic, what I mean by that is, is connecting a sentence, connecting the parts of a sentence in a way that makes the whole thing make sense. Kenneth is academically unqualified for the job at the university. Blank. I, I always read the words as blanks the first time because when, I, when you read it with the word that, that's there, it can bias you. You know what I mean? You, your brain can start thinking, oh, yeah, you, you know, um, however is the right choice. Well, however is one of the options. Anyway. He's academically unqualified for the job at the university, blank. He has exhibited a terrible attitude towards the other professors and staff. Think about those two ideas. Think about how they relate to each other. He's academically unqualified and he's exhibited a terrible attitude towards the other professors and staff. Basically, like this guy's a problem, right? Like no, no one likes Kenneth. Uh, he's unqualified and he's a jerk. So how do I connect these things in a way that makes them sort of agree um, that he's the kind of a jerk. The answer is moreover. Moreover is sort of like this not, you know, not to mention the fact that, you know, in addition, also, um, plus version of connecting these ideas that basically like, let's, let's list all of the reasons why no one likes Kenneth. Um, sorry if your name is Kenneth. I didn't mean to insult you, but um, you're not this Kenneth, hopefully. If you are, then maybe you should look for other work. Pointless. Okay, anyway, the right answer is moreover because that links the ideas in the sentence. Moving on. Um, author's intent. So they'll ask you about this. They'll ask you about, they'll, they'll tell you what the author was trying to do and then ask you if they did it. 
Um, and the strategy for this one is that bulletproof strategy, give them what they want. Just know what the questions, you know, really hone in on what the question is asking you to deliver and answer that question. So let me show you. Given that all of the choices are true, it's always going to say that um, on the ACT um, and sometimes on the SAT, which one provides the most detailed visual description of the team's uniforms? You want to hone in on a handful of words here. It's like, what do they want from me? They want detailed visual description. Those three words. That's all I'm looking for. Let's look at the answer choices. A says uniforms. Are there details there? Is there anything visual? No. A is short, but wrong. So the shorter is better than works really well. Um, it's not universal though, right? It's like, it's, it works like 75 or 80% of the time. Um, this is the 20 to 25% when it doesn't work. B says uniforms that ne never seem to get fully clean in the wash. Is that, that visual? Really? Uh, C says uniforms with the green piping and the yellow letters looking pretty good. And then D says uniforms that had been introduced in the 1970s. That's grammatical and that's historical, but it's not visual. It's got to be C. We have two colors. We have the piping and the letters mentioned. That's, that's visual, right? Um, and piping. Whenever you talk about piping, you're getting into the details. I, think that's, I, I can stand by that. That's, that's a truism. Um, the answer is C because we gave them what they want. Okay, uh, diction. This is an interesting one. This is, uh, it was on both tests actually, and ACT has increased its use of it recently. Uh, SAT definitely prioritizes this. These are word usage questions based on standard English. It's, it's, it's vocabulary, but it's vocabulary that you know, and just using, using that vocabulary um, in the conventional way. Um, so let me show you. <laughs> it's so much easier just to give a freaking demonstration rather than like describe it for half an hour. Um, the technique you want to use here is basically ask yourself, how would I say this? You know, is this the way I would use this word? Um, because it's based on standard English, that's based on usage essentially. Uh, and your usage is what you want to trust in this situation. So this is true on the ACT, but it, very true on the SAT. When you're in doubt, go boring slash academic. Go with the sort of like tiredest, tritest, most like, I mean, not uninteresting, but just like least entertaining way to say it. Um, that will serve you, I'm sorry to say, but it will. So here's a, a sample sentence. Miranda was granted employee of the year because of both her innovative ideas and her consummate professionalism. So we're choosing between granted, entitled, named, and presented. If you saw those words out of context, you'd basically say they all mean the same thing. And they are very closely related. They just have slightly different uses. The one that would work in this situation is named. Like she got, she basically earned this title, employee of the year. Um, entitled, Gosh, I mean, if you're not a native English speaker, you're going to see that word and be like, what's the freaking difference? You know, like the, <laughs> that's a title that she got. Wasn't she entitled that? Well, we just don't use that word in that situation. So um, this is a tricky one for those people, especially non-native English speakers. If you're one of those people, there is still hope. There is hope, 100%. You just need to do a lot of reading and writing and practicing and SAT work um to get to know this stuff as well as you possibly can um the the more you use the language the easier and easier these questions get if you, you're taking this test at age like 16 17 maybe 18 um if you took the test at age 25 you'd do a lot better because you'd have you know most of a decade of experience to work with unfortunately well fortunately for you you don't have to take it at age 25 because you're not like me who's still taking it at age 40. Um, woe is me. It's not that bad. Anyway, um, idioms. Idioms are kind of like diction questions, but instead of using words, we use phrases. Um, it's their vocabulary questions with phrases. I'll show you what I mean here. Despite numerous failure, failures in the early stages of testing, I had confidence with our initial designs. So we're looking at that phrase confidence with, right? Every Every underlined part of the sentence is what we're worried about. Um, when you feel good about something, do you have confidence with it? No. 
the phrase, the correct phrase, when we trust our, you know, our native English tongue here, or not, not even native, but our um, standard English tongue is confidence in. Um, I had confidence in our initial design. The right answer is B there, just based on standard English. So kind of a strange topic, right? Um, it, it feels a little bit like, for some students, it feels unfair. For the rest of students, they get these questions right without even thinking about them. So um, it's, a, it, it's, it's kind of a memorization game, but it's really a, a, a practice with English game that you want to do here to feel confident on diction and idiom questions. So organization, this is a topic on both tests. It's, it, you know, it, it maybe makes up 10% of the questions. So it's not a huge topic, but it's really important. Um, what's gonna happen is you're gonna be asked to move sentences within a paragraph. You're gonna be asked to reorder paragraphs within an essay. Um, and the techniques that you use to do so um, are gonna rely on these, these four different tools. Um, it's really hard to do a sample question here because I have to have you read an entire passage and I'm nice enough not to do that. So here are the clues though that you want to look for to place something in the right spot. Um, number one, probably the easiest one is pronouns. Basically, if your sentence that you're moving around says she, well, you better make sure that the sentence before that, probably, probably the sentence right before it, maybe the sentence two before that, uh, tells you who she is. Um, that's, yeah, I mean, that, they actually use that one. It's, it's a pretty easy clue, but if you, if you have a pronoun, also, by the way, if you have a pronoun in the sentence that follows, so the sentence that you're moving into the paragraph has a female name, and the next sentence says she, and that's the she that it's referring to, that's good. That's what you're looking for, probably. Um, look for transition words. So look for, say, a however. The however within a paragraph is going to change the direction, right? It's like, Let's talk about all of the good things that pertain to, um, oh my God, I'm going to use an SAT passage, but um, uh, Greek yogurt. Um, and then let's look at, you know, however, let's look at all the bad things about Greek yogurt. If the sentence you're moving in is a positive thing about Greek yogurt, put it in the first half. If it's a bad thing, put it in the second half, right? So use that, that word, however, as a sort of like borderline point. Uh, pay attention to verb tense. So watch how the verb tense progresses within a paragraph. Sometimes it will kind of like go through the history of something and then get to the present tense as we move through the paragraph or start in the past to get to the present and move to the future. Use the verb tenses to put a sentence in the right spot. And then the last thing is purpose. Um, <coughs> excuse me. My throat gets dry when I talk for an hour straight. Um, Think about the function of a sentence. So um, one sentence that I saw recently was, um, and it wasn't a very interesting sentence, but it said, um, there are three reasons, or sorry, there are, there are several reasons why this is true. Okay, what kind of sentence is that? To me, that sentence is previewing what I'm about to say. Like I said, it's not a great sentence, but it's setting up uh, sort of a demonstration of you know what are these things you know what are the what are the, the you know the reasons that we should know if it's doing that it should be at the beginning of the paragraph it should probably be the first sentence of the paragraph to set that paragraph up um, these essays are not that interesting and so you might be kind of loath to even put that sentence in there but if a sentence needs a topic sorry if a paragraph needs a topic sentence then that's where you want to move it um, think about purpose in terms of moving paragraphs around too is this paragraph setting up the entire essay is it concluding is it um a, you know a body paragraph is it like providing details that prove the whole point of the, the essay true um think about function be a reader that's that other big strategy be a reader okay i think this is our last slide so um we're doing awesome here style um this is mostly an sat topic it's on the act a tiny yeah it's on the act a little bit um, it's definitely on the on every single SAT, and, and my, my alternate title here is keeping it academic. Basically, that's their default position, is they want you to um, always write in a particular style. This is the SAT I'm talking about. ACT has a little bit more flexibility. They'll have some funny passages, um, but the SAT is dry, just straightforward, what you'd read in class and school, and that's it. 
Um, so you want to match that style when you have to answer a question pertaining to style. Um, so here, here's a sample. Light pollution is a huge problem for local astronomers. On the SAT, that's wrong. Because huge problem is a huge problem. It's like, we all know what that's trying to say, but it's not the academic way to say it. Here's the better version according to the SAT. And it really is the better version. I mean, it, it, I, I can concede that. Um, it's not, I don't know, it's not as colloquial, which can be a good thing. They, they really don't want you to be colloquial. So light pollution poses a significant challenge to local astronomers. That's the right version. They both mean the same thing. The first one's even shorter than the second one, but is a huge problem. Is it the academic way to say it? You want to default to the academic way to say it. Sorry. <laughs> um, I, I don't write the tests. I just help you ace them. Okay, that's it. That's it. I mean, that's literally it. Can you believe it? Um, I don't have my timer going. I think that was about 45, 50 minutes. Pretty efficient to get through one quarter of the test. So here are things you can do going forward. You can take a practice test with us. That's a great way to get started. Um, just find out, you know, take a practice ACT and a practice SAT. See what how they feel for you. Get a good comparison between them. There's a lot of overlap between them and then some differences too. And, and, and we definitely have students who strongly prefer one format to the other. Um, so it's, it's worth exploring that. If you email contact at tutor10.com, you can, you can take practice tests. Um, we also have those online courses, and this is that offer I mentioned at the very beginning. So learn.tutorted.com, that's, that's the website where all of our online courses are located. And you'll notice near the top of the page there are three kind of umbrella courses, SAT, Joint SAT and ACT, and ACT. Um, all three of those courses, you can use this promo code, first month free. And just as you might guess, you will get the first month free if you enter that code. You have to put your credit card number in, but you will not be charged. Um, you'll be charged on like day 31, maybe day 32, but I think day 31, I, I should know this, <laughs> uh, but I don't. Um, no earlier than day 31 would you actually be charged for the course. So um, if you want to, you can study the course, you can learn it all and sign out before day 31 and get the whole thing for free, which is cool. But if you like it and you dig it and, you, and it's helping you study, then stick with it too. Um, and then the last thing you can do is if you're curious about the online course or our tutoring, that, that's that's what we do most really is tutoring, um, then give us a call. Call us at 310-600-9595. Uma will pick up the phone and she's very knowledgeable and fairly delightful to talk to. Um, I think you'll agree with me on that. Um, that is the presentation because I'm doing this not live. I don't have to take any, I have, I have no questions to take. There are no questions. Um, if you have any grammar questions, send me an email, email contact at tutorted.com, and I promise you we'll get right back to you. Um, thank you so much for your time. I hope you found this helpful, and uh, that's it, tutorted.